Hey, my fellow coders, and welcome back to the third part of this video series where we are creating a Minecraft clone in JavaScript. Why are we doing that? Because we can. So what are we working on today? Let's take a look. There's gonna be three main parts that we're working on here. So the first you can see is resources. So I have some stone in the back here. We have some coal here. We can change the scarcity of these resources. We can change the size of the deposits. It's a bit hard to see right now. So we'll peel back the terrain a little bit later. You can see what these resources look like, but we're gonna be using 3D noise to create these little pockets of resources underneath the terrain. So that'll be really fun. The second thing that we're working on, as you've probably noticed, if you're an astute observer, is textures. So we have these beautiful pixelated Minecraft textures that look much better than the flat colors we had before. So I've just loaded a classic Minecraft texture pack here, and we're applying these textures to the blocks. And last but not least, we're going to be adding some shadows. So you can see that we have some shadows here being cast by this mountain. And this just adds a lot of depth to the game and just makes everything look a lot sharper. So those will be the three things that we're working on in this video. So without further ado, let's get to it. All right, so I'm picking up right where we left off in part two of this video series. So let's just jump right into it. Let's add those resources. First, I'm gonna open up our blocks file and we need to add some stone here. So I'm going to add another entry to our blocks object here. And let's call this stone, give it an ID of three, name stone. And we'll just give that a little bit of a gray color. So now that we have our new block type defined, let close out this file, we're done with that, go into our world file. Now to begin with, I'm going to be hiding our terrain because that's just going to hide the resources that we're generating. Um, but we'll need a new function here called generate resources. And I'm going to define that right before generate terrain. Now generating our resources is going to be very similar to how we did the terrain generation with one minor difference in that we're using 3D noise instead of 2D noise. So what exactly is 3D noise and how does that compare to 2D noise? With 2D noise, the X and Z coordinates correspond to the horizontal position in our world. We pass these values into our 2D simplex noise function to get a value which ultimately determines the height of the terrain at that location. With 3D noise, we compute a noise value at each X, Y, and Z coordinate in our world. We generate pockets of resources by thresholding these noise values. Any location where the noise value is above the threshold, we create a block, and any value below the threshold is left empty. We first need to define a triple for loop here where we iterate over the x, y, and the z. So let's go ahead and compute the 3D noise value at this location. So we're going to need a simplex noise generator and a random number generator. Now we want our world to always be the same each time we generate it. And as you remember, we created this um, special random number generator class where we can pass in a seed and it'll always spit out the same sequence of random numbers. So we want to reuse this same random number generator when we're generating resources so that all the resources, all the terrain, everything is gonna be exactly the same each time we generate the world with a specific seed. So I'm going to actually take this line here and we're gonna move that up to our main generate function. And then we're gonna pass that in to generate resources and generate terrain. So let's add that parameter here and here as well. And then we're going to define a new simplex noise generator in each method. So we'll add a new one in here as well. Okay, so now that we have a simplex noise generator, we can compute the value. So we'll do simplex, and you see there's a noise 3D function here, and this takes in the x, y, and z. So for each set of x, y, z coordinates, we get a unique noise value. Now, what are we gonna do with that value? We're gonna threshold that. So anything below the threshold will not be a block. Anything above the threshold will be a block. So let's just use some placeholder values for now for the scale and the scarcity, just so we can kind of see what this looks like. So 
if the value is greater than 0 0.5, then we will set the block ID at the set of XYZ coordinates to stone. And let's scale our noise a little bit so it's a bit more smoothed out. And now if you go and look at our world, we can see that we have our stone resource being generated. So you can see we get kind of these blob structures here. So by changing that threshold value, the 0 0.5, it's going to make those blobs bigger or make them smaller, depending on what we set this to. And the, the scale values here are going to control the overall size of those blobs. So let's add those parameters in. Let's add some UI controls so we can tune that right from the UI. So going back into our blocks file, I'm going to add those parameters right in here. So we'll add a scale, and this will be an object with an X, Y, and Z scale. And then that threshold, let's call that scarcity. So we'll just set that to 0 0.5. Now we need to add some UI controls for that. So similarly to how we're controlling the properties of our world object, we can also import blocks here, and we can tune the properties on our blocks. So we can modify these properties in real time right from the UI. So I'm going to add a new resources folder. And then I'm going to go ahead and add some controls to uh, tune those parameters. All right, so I went ahead and added some UI controls for those parameters. You can see we're controlling scarcity as well as the X, Y, and Z scales. So lastly, let's go into world here and Let's get rid of these hard-coded constants, and instead we'll do blocks.stonescale.x, and then we're going to use the scarcity value here. So now if we go back into our game here, I could lower the scarcity, and that's going to make the resource less scarce, aka more abundant, and it's going to make the resource deposits bigger. As I increase that, the deposits will get smaller. So we'll set that to some value here, and then you can see as I control these scales, it's going to control the size in that particular axis. So now that we have our resources defined, we need to go and add our terrain back in. So how that is going to work is that everything above grass level gets removed, everything below we keep and fill in the empty space with dirt. So let's go add that terrain back in. So let's first uncomment our generate terrain function, and then let's go down and modify that a bit. So we need to modify this logic here. So right here, we only want to set the blocks to dirt if there's not a resource block already there. So we'll just add to the condition here. Now we need to modify this case slightly because anything that doesn't pass here is going to fall through. So if y is greater than height, then we want to set the blocks to empty. So now we can go and look at our terrain here and we can see that we're getting these resource deposits but everything that is at the height of the terrain is being set to grass. We now have our resources fully integrated with our terrain and I think it's time that we add a few more resource types in. So we'll add coal and we'll add an iron as well. So back in our blocks file, let's create two more entries. We'll do one for coal ore and then another for iron ore and we'll just go ahead and update these properties and then we'll just tweak these parameters a bit to make it a little different from the stone. So now that we have our coal ore and our iron ore blocks defined we need to go back into our world file and we need to update generate resources to generate those blocks in, in addition to the stone. So right now, this is sort of hard-coded into just generate the stone. So we need to wrap everything here in one more for loop to iterate over all those resources. So I'm actually going to define a separate array in this file at the bottom here. So we'll do export const resources, and that is going to be equal to an array that contains blocks.stone, blocks dot coal ore and blocks dot iron ore. So then back in world, let's import the resources and now we can iterate over this array 
and generate all of those resources. So going back down to our function here, I'm going to do resources.for each. And then for each resource, we want to run all of this code. So we're basically going to be running this resource generation code three times, one for each of the resource types. So all we need to do is to replace blocks.stone with resource. So there, we've adapted to generate resources to handle multiple resources. Now we need to update the UI code as well to expose controls for all of our different block types. So let's go into our UI file and everywhere where we see stone, we're gonna have to update that as well. So I've updated our UI code to handle multiple resources. So really all I've done, I've imported resources here at the top. We don't need blocks anymore. And then iterating over all those resources, I actually create another subfolder for each resource just to keep things a bit more organized. And then all the code we had before is basically the same, but we're now adding that to the resource folder and we're accessing the properties on resource instead of blocks.stone. So if we save this and then go back to our game here, you can see we have a whole bunch of different controls on the side and you can already see that uh, we have our coal resource defined in here. Now everything's a bit hidden by the terrain, so I think I'm going to quickly disable terrain generation so we can see all of these resources hidden underneath here. All right, so I've just temporarily disabled terrain generation so we can see what's going on under the hood here. We have our three resource subfolders. So we have stone, coal ore, and iron ore. So let's say I want to increase the scarcity of the stone. So we'll make it a little less abundant. And then I want to squash it down in the y-axis. So I'll reduce the scale there and maybe spread it out in the x and the z-axis. Now we can go into coal. Let's say I want to do little tiny pockets of coal ore. So I'll make the scales a bit smaller here. And then I will just increase the scarcity a bit. So just have these little pockets of coal in our terrain. And then the iron ore is something that is going to be more scarce. You got to mine a bit more to find that. So let's tweak that a bit. The scarcity is already quite high. And let's reduce the scales a bit. And let's say we have these kind of flat veins of iron ore that sort of dig down into the terrains. So you can see that we can independently control the formation of all these different resources. And it's very easy if we want to go back and add more resources. All we need to do is go into our blocks file and we just need to add more block types here. And then each block type that's a resource will add it to the resources array. So it it's a very extensible way of adding the resources into the game. So in terms of our first task of adding resources to our world, we're completely done with that now. We've added everything that we needed to. We can control the scarcity, the scale, and we can define multiple resources. So the next two tasks that we need to do are adding textures and adding shadows. So let's do the textures first, and then we'll finish up with the shadows. So before we add textures to our game, we need textures that we can work with or image files. Mojang, who creates Minecraft, actually has a GitHub repository that contains all the Minecraft assets for modders to use. So in this GitHub repository, we can go under resource pack and we can go under textures and blocks. And here you can see it has the PNG files for all of the different blocks in the game. So this is what I'm using for the textures. You are more than welcome to use any other texture pack that you can find. And I'll be sure to provide a link to this repository in the description down below. So we're back in our code now, and you can see under the public folder, I've added a new directory called textures. And under here, I've added all the different textures that we're going to be using in the creation of this Minecraft clone. So we're gonna be importing all of these textures using 3JS, and then we're gonna be creating materials that use these textures and then adding those to the blocks. So right now in our world file, we're defining the material for our blocks. It's all the same because they're all just a flat color. So we just have one material that we're using. We're gonna be defining materials on each of our blocks now because they all have different textures. So let's go ahead and delete that material. Now that's going to pose some problems when we're generating the meshes because our instance mesh expects that each instance has the same material. 
So there's a couple different approaches for handling this. I'm going to take a kind of simple, non-optimal, naive approach. And we're just going to create a new instance mesh for each block type that we have. Now this works in the case of the game that we're working on, because we're just going to have a few different block types. But if I were to be making a full production Minecraft game, there's actually some manipulation you can do to the default shaders. So much like how we're setting the color here, we can modify the shader code for instance mesh to set the texture for each block type. But that's a bit more advanced than I wanted to cover in this tutorial series. So we're just gonna be using the multiple instance meshes for each block type. Now, in order to load the textures, we're going to need to use a texture loader. So first let's import the 3GS library, and then let's create a texture loader. Now let's create a separate function here where we will load the texture. So we'll pass in the path to the texture in our assets directory here, and then we'll create that texture by loading it using our texture loader. And I'm going to be loading everything synchronously, which is definitely not the best way of doing it, um, but it will keep things a bit simpler. Um, but in production code, I would use load async here so the client isn't waiting for all of the textures to load. Now, one additional thing that we need to do to our texture is we need to set the color space to three and that'll be the sRGB color space. So I'm not going to get into color spaces that's far too complex for this video. So as of 3JS version 152, you need to set the color space on your textures to the sRGB color space for them to appear correctly, or they will likely look washed out. So once we do that, then we can return the texture. Now what we're going to do next is we're going to create an object that contains all of our textures that we need and then we'll reference those textures as we create new materials for each of our blocks. So I've defined all of our textures here. You can see we're loading in for now just the dirt, the top of the grass block, and then the sides of the grass block, and then our stone, coal, and iron textures. Now for each of our block types, we need to define a material property. The grass block is actually gonna be a little bit different because each side has a different texture on it. So on the top, it's gonna to be grass. On the bottom, it's gonna to be dirt. And on the sides, it's going to be, well, I can just pull it up here. It's going to be the kind of this little grass overhang on the side, and then the rest will be dirt. So the 3JS G box geometry, you can actually pass in an array of six materials, and it will apply a different material to each side of that box. So I'll quickly define the materials array for our grass block. So you can see the, the first entry here is for the right side. Then we have the left, top, bottom, front, and back. So the top is set to grass, the bottom is set to dirt. So we just needed to define these six different Lambert materials. Now the rest of our blocks all have the same texture on each side, so they'll be a bit simpler. So we'll just be doing a material for dirt, and that'll be a new mesh Lambert material. And then we'll set the map property, so this maps the texture to textures.dirt. And let, I'm going to go ahead and add materials to the rest of our block types. All right, so we have textures for our stone, coal, and iron ore blocks now. So we're all set to create our new instance meshes and use these materials instead of the other material that we had defined in our world class. So we're going to start by creating a lookup table where the key is the block ID. So that lookup table is going to be an object called meshes. So to build out our lookup table, we're going to get the values of our blocks object. Then let's filter out the empty block. And then for each of those, we're going to create an instance mesh. The max count is a constant for all of the different meshes. So we'll just move that up here. And then let's take this code and we'll add it inside of our for loop here. Now, rather than using this material, which we previously had defined at the top of the file, we're going to get the material associated with this particular block type. And then for debug purposes, let's set the name of our mesh to the name of the block type. And then finally, we're going to add this mesh to our lookup table. Our lookup table, we're using the block ID for the key. So we'll do block type 
dot ID will be equal to mesh. Now we've defined all of these instance meshes here. So let's go down into the inner loop here where we're creating all of our instances. So we can start by eliminating this line here. We won't need that. And I'm actually gonna move the empty block ID check up to the top here. So if block ID is equal to blocks.empty.id, then we'll just continue there. Otherwise, we'll get the mesh by using our lookup table and we'll pass in the block ID. Um, now we no longer need this line here since we're using textures, not colors. So we can go ahead and remove that. And then finally at the bottom here, we need to add all of the instance meshes instead of just a single one. So now if we go and look at our game now, we should expect to have some textures and it looks like we do. So I can see some grass here, some dirt, the stone, the coal. So everything is looking as expected. Um, there is one issue though. If you zoom in here, we can see that our textures are really blurry and don't have that sharp, crisp look that we would expect. And that's because 3JS is automatically applying filtering to our textures. So we don't want the type of filtering that it's using. We just want to use nearest neighbor filtering so we need to go back into where we're loading the textures. So we want to locate our load texture function and we're going to change the filtering that we're using. So to texture min filter is equal to three dot nearest filter. And then we'll use the same for the meg filter. So now if we go back to our game and let's zoom in on these blocks, we can see we get nice crisp textures where we can see each individual pixel. So the final thing that we need to do to our scene is to add in some shadows. And that's really quite simple. It just requires tuning a few specific parameters. So let's go into our, our main file and set up the shadows on the renderer. So the first thing that we need to do when adding shadows is we need to enable the shadow map on the renderer. And then for our instance meshes, we also need to set those up so that they cast and receive shadows. So going back up in the code we wrote here where we create those instance meshes, we'll do mesh.castShadow equals true and mesh.receiveShadow equals true. So now that our meshes are set up to cast and receive shadows, we need to set up our lights to also cast shadows. So back in main, I believe is where we have our lights set up here. So I'm just gonna use one directional light. We'll just have one sun in the game. And then we'll set up this light so that cast shadow equals true. And this will enable shadow casting for that light source. I'm also gonna rename this light to sun just so it's a bit clear what that light is. So if we go to our game now, we should expect to see some shadows and things just don't look quite right. We're not really seeing those shadows being cast. So in situations like this, 3JS has a really useful helper class. So what we can do is we can create a shadow helper, and that'll be a new 3.camera helper. And then we're going to pass in the camera associated with the shadow on our sun. Shadows are calculated kind of using a camera. So we can actually take that camera pass it into this camera helper and visualize it. So we'll add that shadow helper to the scene. And now when we go back and look at our world, we can see what the issue is here. Our light source is sitting at the coordinates of 111. So if you go and look, it's sitting there and it's casting towards the origin. This box really should be encapsulating our entire world. We need to update the position of our light as well as the bounds of this box. So first, let's set the position of our light to 50, 50, 50. Now, eventually the light is gonna be following the player as it moves around the world so that the shadows are always being cast um, where the player is in the world. Um, but for now, we'll just use a static position and we need to set some of the shadow properties on our light source. So, so we'll do sun.shadow, and then we'll set some properties on the camera. So we need to set the left, the right, the top, and the bottom bounds of that camera box. And we'll also set up 
the near and the far plane. So if you go back to our game now, we can see that there are indeed shadows being cast. So if let's zoom out a bit so we can see that our box is now completely encapsulating our world. Um, picking 100 might have been a little bit too big. So you actually want to optimize that value because right now our shadows are looking pretty blurry. So if you get that box tighter around the world, it's going to improve the resolution of our shadows. So let's go back and set these to negative 50, 50, negative 50, and 50. So you can see that box is much more closely sized to our world now, and the shadows also look much better. So there's still a few artifacts that we need to work out here. Um, you can kind of see some shadow lines along here. We're getting this weird kind of grid along these flat parts. So we can adjust the bias of our shadows, and that will remove that. So we'll set the bias on our shadow to minus 0 0.005. I want to pick very small values here. Um, this has quite a significant effect when you pick larger values. Looks like we set that value quite a bit too big. Um, we're getting some weird artifacting here. We'll do 0 0.0005. And I think that's pretty good. Um, we could still probably tweak it a bit more, but um, that's better than what we had. And I noticed some of the artifacting is improved on the flat ground as well. Now, just for your awareness, there are different shadow types that we can use. So we can actually go to our renderer, go to shadow map, and the type. So if I just type in 3.shadow here, so you can see there's a basic shadow map, a PCF soft shadow, VSM shadow, and a PCF shadow. Now, the PCF soft shadow is going to be the best looking one. Um, that's going to be the most performance intensive, whereas basic is going to be the best performance, but it's going to look the worst. So, so you can see with the basic shadow map, we're getting very jagged edges here. It doesn't look very good. I much prefer the smooth effect. So let's go and look at PCF shadow, and that looks pretty good. We get a bit of smoothing on the edges. So let's try the PCF soft shadow map a very soft looking shadow and I think this really has the best look. So we'll, we'll go with, with, with this for now until we have some performance issues. So one last thing that you can tweak to improve the either the performance or the quality of the shadows is setting the resolution of the shadow map. So that is also set on the light source itself. So we'll do sun.shadow and then you can set the map size and this will be a vector two so let's set this to something really low for now. We'll do 256 by 256. And you can see that it's it's very blurry and the shadows almost don't even show up in some cases. Now, let's go on the opposite extreme. I'll do 2048 by 2048. You should always um, pick powers of two here. And now you can see that we get a much sharper shadow. So it kind of depends on the look you want to go for here. Um, I think we'll probably choose something in between. So I'll do maybe 512 by 512. Let's take a look at that. Um, I kind of prefer the blurriness here. It helps kind of reduce the harshness of all the jagged edges in the world. So I think we'll stick with that value. And there's probably a bit more tuning we could do on the bias, but I think that'll suit us well enough for now. So there you have it. That's all I planned on covering in this video. We added in some new block types. We added in some resources, added some textures and some shadows, and our world is really starting to come together now. And I think with the textures in there, it really looks like Minecraft. So in the next video, we're going to be adding a playable character that we can move around with the keyboard and mouse. And then in the video after that, the fifth video, we're going to be adding collision detection. So the player will actually be interacting with the world They'll be able to move around, run into blocks, jump up and down hills. I think that'll really start to feel like a game at that point. So thank you so much for watching the series. If you want to be notified of the new lessons coming out, be sure to hit the subscribe button below. And please like this video. It really helps out the channel. So until next time, take care, everyone. Thanks for watching.